Welcome to Visibility Clinic, where healthcare does self care. I'm Dr. Van, a pain and function specialist. Healthcare professionals such as myself are supposed to be, well, professional. But medical issues are almost always uncomfortable, awkward, unpleasant, or embarrassing to talk about. So it's easy to be unkind about this if we're not careful about what we say and how we say it. If your doctor has ever said something insensitive, offensive, or ignorant, it's not their fault. They just don't know any better, even though they should. So today we're going to be talking about euphemisms. <clears throat> a euphemism is a mild or pleasant term that is used to describe something that's otherwise unpleasant. I'm going to go over five things that come up in healthcare that could be perceived as negative, offensive, or embarrassing, and their corresponding euphemisms that are more appropriate in a healthcare setting. If we use language that is accurate without being disrespectful, we can get past most of the discomfort and be more helpful to our patients. So get ready to get uncomfortable with me. Number one, fat. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. All the casual common terms like fat, big, heavy, obese, even if they're technically accurate, they carry a lot of negative connotation and people are really self-conscious about their weight whether they show it or not. The modern American lifestyle is notorious for processed foods, inactivity, and judging people for their appearance. And quarantine has not helped. Most people would rather be a healthier weight. So making someone even more self-conscious by calling them fat, heavy, or even obese is the opposite of helpful. Instead, you should say and document high BMI or high body mass index. It's more scientific and implies the healthy goal of achieving a lower BMI. And don't harp on weight during an encounter if that's not a patient's priority. That would just come off as oblivious and condescending. Number two. <laughs> Number two. Number two. Stupid. It doesn't matter if someone's got multiple degrees or if they didn't finish high school. No one should be referred to as stupid when they're seeking to improve their health. If a doctor is concerned about someone's ability to understand complex medical concepts, they should be described as having limited insight. I mean, if you think about it, everyone outside of the healthcare profession is less knowledgeable about medicine than their doctors. If there are other barriers to communication or learning, like a visual, auditory, or intellectual disability, or their primary language is not your primary language, providing accommodations for these are the standard of care and should be easily accessible. Number three, inconsiderate of time. Typically, doctors have maybe 20 minutes to spend with an individual patient. It's hard to be productive in such a short amount of time, so that time is so precious. When someone is rambling, veering off topic, or kind of scatterbrained, they can be respectfully described as tangential or requiring frequent redirection. Number four, sloppy or smelly. Personally, when I document, my default is to describe everyone as well-groomed. But when a patient I'm seeing doesn't fit that description, I simply remove that language from my note. And I know what that means. Other gentler terms you could use are disheveled, unkempt, or malodorous. But I think it's enough to say that someone is not well-groomed. It's accurate without being judgmental or negative, and noting this observation is actually a valuable component of a physical exam. I'll explain why in the second part of this video. Number five special needs. Ugh. I particularly don't like this term because, let's be honest, we are all special in our own way, which makes none of us special. And when everyone's super, <laughs> no one will be. <laughs> Using the term special needs says more about the person saying it than the person they're describing. Special needs, ugh, I don't even like saying it this much. It just sounds, ugh. It's a super vague term that has no place in the medical vocabulary. Be more specific. Does the person you're describing have communication issues, mobility issues, cognitive issues? Healthcare professionals should be using more specific, descriptive language, and better yet, actual diagnostic terms. That's what they are for. That's why we learned them. Okay, so this is the second part of the video where I tell you why it's so important to use this euphemistic language. It's not enough to just seem respectful or to spare people's feelings, even though that's all very important. The goal is to find solutions to manage these issues. Let's go through the list one more time. Number one, 
high BMI, or body mass index. In my line of work, if I'm talking with someone about their weight, I'm usually trying to help them get their BMI below 40 because only then will they qualify for an elective surgery they want or need, like a knee replacement or a gastric bypass. Fun fact, waist circumference is actually a better predictor than BMI when it comes to negative health outcomes. Just something I learned as a surgery intern. If reducing BMI, weight, or waist circumference is a patient's primary concern, you can offer many solutions. You can encourage enjoyable physical activity, prescribe easy exercises, educate them about a balanced diet, recommend they do a food journal to increase their awareness of their intake, and you can refer them to nutrition counseling. But most people already know if they exercise more and ate better, they would lose weight. So you could end up sounding like a broken record. Take it a step further and explore what's preventing someone from losing weight. For example, if they're dealing with depression, offer referrals to mental health professionals, counseling, support groups, and other resources. If their environment is preventing them from exercising, like maybe they don't feel safe walking around in their neighborhood, or maybe they live in an abusive home, then you know that there are social support services you need to connect them to. And again, if they have a high BMI, but they're not asking for your help with it, don't focus on their weight. And instead, just listen to what they need your help with. Number two, limited insight. If someone you're trying to help has limited insight and you bombard them with medical terminology they can't understand, you're not being an effective healthcare provider. Cut out the big words and big concepts and take the time to offer simplified verbal and written summaries of what you discussed during your visit. This significantly helps to improve someone's understanding of their health issues. Yes, it takes a little extra effort to type out your summary of your plan. It takes a little extra time to get an interpreter or explain things to a family member again, but it's what doctors are paid to do. If the person you're trying to help doesn't understand your plan, your plan is useless. I actually give written summaries to all of my patients, even when they have good insight, because it's helpful for everyone to be on the same page. Even people with good insight forget things. Guilty. Number three, tangential. If someone's a bit of a rambler, guilty. There's nothing wrong with that. It could be a personality thing, or they could have issues with attention or cognition. But when someone needs frequent redirection during a medical visit, that means there's less time spent on actual problem solving. To best help these types of patients, you can book them for longer visits. You can establish the goal of their visit early on for a more focused discussion on their primary issue. And you can set boundaries so they understand you wanna maximize your time with them. Number four not well-groomed. When someone comes in to see a doctor looking disheveled, this could be a sign of poor health or limited resources. Healthcare professionals should take this observation as an opportunity to address hygiene, self-care, mental health, support at home, housing insecurity, and financial insecurity. I'm telling you, appearance and grooming says a lot about someone's health and wellness. I've had patients for whom on initial visits, I didn't document that they were well-groomed, if you know what I mean. But after I helped them make some progress on their issues, they did start coming in well-groomed. Also, the way someone smells can give you information about their health. Fun fact, the medical term for bad breath is halitosis. So back when I was in training, I once documented that someone smelled of cigarettes. And my boss actually told me to remove that language, probably because he thought it sounded disrespectful. And I get where he was coming from. People can read the notes their doctors write about them, and he didn't want to offend anyone. But I maintain, in my own personal opinion, I wasn't judging the person for smelling like cigarettes. It was just a fact and one of the many findings that I documented on my physical exam. It was particularly relevant for that person because they were trying to quit smoking. I'm not suggesting doctors point out every time they notice an odd smell, but rather they could use that information to be helpful. If someone who's trying to quit smoking noticeably smells like smoke, you might ask them how many cigarettes they're smoking a day and help them set a goal to gradually reduce that number. Fun fact, there's 20 cigarettes in a typical pack. If they say they're smoking 10 cigarettes a day, you can say, oh, okay, so you're smoking a half a pack a day. If they're comfortable and if they're interested, you might make some progress on that front. But if they're in the pre-contemplative phase of quitting, pick another battle. Number five, not special, but rather specific needs in terms of mobility, communication, or cognition, etc. These are very specific to each individual patient, so I'm not gonna detail every possible accommodation medicine can offer. This is a top five video, not a top 500 video. Instead, I'll just emphasize that for any person with a disability, 
always consider safety, like fall risk or aspiration risk, for example, or even polypharmacy, which is a fancy term for being on too many medications that could interact. You can also assess for equipment needs, like a new cane or a walker, wheelchair repairs or seating adjustments. Uh, you can consider referral to therapies like PT, OT, or speech therapy. And overall, you can see if they would benefit from any level of assistance throughout their day, whether that's through assistive technology or a care navigator or a health aide or a caregiver, a family member. You get it. Okay, so hopefully you're feeling a little more comfortable and have better words to use in healthcare settings. Remember, you're not helping anyone if you're using judgmental or disrespectful language. Leave a comment below if you made it this far in the video. Or if you don't feel like typing, at least click one of the thumb buttons. That would be a big help. If you did make it this far in the video and you're not subscribed, what are you waiting for? Thanks for watching. Smart. <laughs>